today we're gonna to talk about some tools to improve or simplify your sound and vibration measurements. Um, while I'm talking, I'll take the mask off here. We're in Ohio, so uh, not doing the best here right now. Um, the, uh, about the motor shop, we are founded in 1990. We're based in Cincinnati. Um, we're an MTS sensors corporation. Um, along with the uh, PCB Piezotronics, who makes accelerometers and such, uh, and a few other companies, Larson Davis, that manufactures sound level meter, um, Acumet for wireless telemetry and such. And the motor shop focuses on shakers and structural test equipment, uh, lab-based dynamic metrology for Cal workstations, um, field calibration and verification for plant monitoring and things like that as well as rental and recalibration services. Um, Chad's my co-presenter. He'll probably be manning the uh, camera, assuming this all works well. Um, got his bachelor's at UC in 2010. He's been here for about seven years. Um, works as an application engineer for both the structural test products as well as the rental. He's a golfer, a racer, uh, snow skiing, and he likes common sense, which I don't know about. His dislikes are rain in the winter and excessively long PowerPoints. So I apologize to Chad already for the beginning of this. Um, you can see me in the video, but my, that's me, Bruce. I got my bachelor's of science in mechanical engineering from UC in 1994. Been here 21 years, and I lead the teams for both rental and recalibration services. I'm not the most patient person on the planet, and uh, I don't like chewing noises. Or presentations that I can't find, can't see if they're any good until the end. So it's pretty early to tell, but this presentation, we'll see how it goes. Um, what we're going to look at today are acoustics, vibration, um, some other related sensing topics, uh, tools for taking better measurements, things that aren't really products, but they can imp improve or simplify your testing life and uh, a nice way of taking data for small channel will end on. Um, I think that a lot of it, a little is like speed dating. If you're familiar with speed dating, um, I'd say that uh, one of our, we do these training sessions at quite a bit. And um, this is one that everyone really likes where we gather all this equipment that people don't know or don't get a touch very much. Um, so we're going to have the camera kind of focus in on a few things today. It's going to be really fast. I think we're going to try to go through about 40, 45 products today in this time. Um, so it's like speed dating. Today's relationship may not be deep, but hopefully you can get a hint of what each offers. And who knows? Maybe some will spark some enough interest for you to find a new love of your testing life. So we'll go here and see what we can do. We're going to start with microphones these can be a little boring so we're not going to use the camera too much for the first few but chad can drag it over to the mics if you want um microphones kind of all look the same and selecting the correct microphone type is one of the keys to successful acoustic measurement there's terms like pre-polarized um, which is zero volt and can be powered with an icp uh, compatible preamp 200 volt um, is a historic type of power for microphones there's questions like free field, pressure field, random incidents, um, quarter inch mics, half inch, one inch mics. The whole thing is there's a ton of options. Um, and thankfully there's a starting point. Uh, there's a microphone handbook downloadable on PCB's learn section of their site, fantastic. Um, and again, anytime I mention in today's note about a handbook or a downloadable uh, FAQ or something, these will be included in the post webinar email that you get from us. Um, and then also PCB has a lot of webinars that are on demand. You can view anytime you want. These are fantastic too. Um, so part of the nature today is just awareness. Uh, these acoustic education topics are available on demand and they include just another intro, um, multi-channel arrays, uh, direct field noise testing, wind tunnels, sound power basics, acoustic calibration. It's a fantastic resource that again, we'll include the link to. Um, 
One last thing I want to say is know your manufacturer. Um, it's a note about microphones and sensors in general. Uh, I don't know if this really fits as a tool or a simplification, but I would just encourage that beyond just checking the specs of something used, check out things like beyond the spec. Investigate the trustworthiness of your vendor that's evidenced by things like warranties, individualized calibrations versus generalized calibrations, and history, how long someone's been around. Uh, I think that says a lot going away. Uh, proving out, it's a, it's a nice tip and trick to make sure you're gonna get a quality measurement. So I'm gonna fly through five microphone types that I think are quite nice and quite uh, clever that we manufacture at our sister company, PCB. The 378A04 is a great example. It's a match system. It has a really high sensitivity mic with a low noise preamp with a filter that allows the free field response to stay flat over a wide frequency range. Um, the noise floor is down to five and a half dB uh, A weighted. And if you're doing third octave band, it's better than zero dB. It's a pre-polarized mic. It does require four milliamps. If you remember the ICP standard is open from two to 20 milliamps. But the ICP benefit is, you know, cost and ease of use when it comes to cabling and things. This is fantastic mic for computer disk drive testing, electric vehicles, um, for sound quality, cabin noise measurements, uh, environmental noise monitoring where it's really quiet like a national park, um, appliance noise source location, uh, and on and on. Uh, there's a low noise one inch pressure field cartridge, uh, model 377A15. It's the same cost and use benefit pre-polarized. This one's primarily um, meant for pressure response. It occurs when a mic is flush mounted at the boundary of a sound field. Pressure mics accurately measure the sound pressure for ducts or cavities or impedance tubes, wind tunnels, and couplers. Uh, the coupler's application is primarily what we make this microphone for. It's used in a lot of audiometry calibration solutions um, and paired with of those adapters for, you know, hearing calibration of hearing testing devices. A nice mic that's relatively new, it's a water and dust resistant mic system. Um, it has a replaceable water and dust resistant cover and it's acoustically transparent but it's unobtrusive alternative to windscreens and it gives a really consistent response versus other folks will make like a rubber protective cover. Um, the microphone has a wide dynamic range from 30 dB to 150 dB before it clips. Uh, it's an array mic, but it's still equipped with a rugged stainless steel grid cap, uh, similar to the high-end mics that we manufacture. It's a great pick for large channel array microphone applications, outdoor measurements, high humidity, or something harsh industrial where dust or oil might be a concern. And oh, uh, there's two more mics and I apologize. It's kind of a, a little product heavy at the beginning here, but these mics I think are fantastic. It really is a little hard to make a mic seem sexy because of the way they all look the same. This 378A21, system is an industry exclusive for random incidents for cabin testing or building acoustics or reverb rooms a lot of random incidents mics that had previously released didn't go through the full frequency range they were only spec to about 16 kilohertz this mic goes through 20 kilohertz and beyond um, yeah and it's a small half inch package same benefit of the pre-polarized system and the last mic I want to focus on in this um, is a very low frequency mic system. Um, great for wind turbines, sonic booms, uh, earthquake and tornado. It has a low frequency filter adapter in line. And for anything infrasound, this is the perfect pick. It's great for less than, you know, 0 0.1 hertz at the minus 3 dB point. Um, so... Acoustic pressure waves can be altered by putting a microphone in that field. Um, and just like any free field mic, this 377A07 system is calibrated to compensate for its own presence. So it gets you a more accurate measurement within a free field. Um, so I'm going to kind of 
zoom in on this one now. These are some nice tips that sometimes a lot of these products, we just hear from people and say, hey, I didn't know you had that. That's really handy. So a lot of these things we're going to be talking about here are these. These microphone clips, um, there's three models. What they do is they provide a press fit um, between the microphone preamplifier and a standard camera tripod. Um, you can kind of see Chad just clipped it in and you can see the base kind of zoom in on the base. Oh, that is the swivel one. <laughs> but that goes to a standard camera tripod. Um, so you have a really easy choice just using any tripod you can find. It's a quarter 20 that goes to a standard camera mount. And there's options for a quarter inch pre preamplifier, a half inch preamplifier, and a kit that includes both of those plus a swivel bait. So it's kind of a universal kit. We make whole systems in addition to, you know, audiometer couplers and room acoustics products. Uh, a product that we made recently from our Larson Davis division uh, is a binaural test fixture. It's a goofy looking guy. He's, uh, he's perfect at measuring headphones, um, you know, on a production line or for R&D. Uh, he's a little two channel device. So we'll actually see a little analyzer that you can use to digitize the signals when you're taking the data right away too. Uh, it's again, great for R&D or for end of line test. Um, you can calibrate the microphone real simply um, in place which uh, if you're doing any microphone testing, we have another webinar just devoted to that very topic, what the difference is between a field calibration and the uh, in-place calibration or a, a lab calibration. A newer product that we have is a uh, wireless noise dosimeters from Larson Davis. It's the Spartan series. Um, this is perfect. We're showing a kit here with um, five of them in place. They're actually, they can charge in this kit. You just wirelessly wear them. Um, it's for workplace noise exposure measurements. It's really easy. You can charge it, download data. You can, um, it powers with the Bluetooth. And there's a program that we include Atlas that offers the test setup, monitoring, data review, and the reporting all via a mobile device. Oops, sorry. Seems like that. So you can kind of see the size of it and you could wear it on your arm. Um, or at uh, the top of your shoulder, and it has microphone clips on the dosimeter as well. Um, we offer a complete noise monitoring kit from Larson Davis, uh, based on the 831C sound advisor. This is meant for either permanent noise uh, monitoring or temporary, which could be, you know, months long. Some of the advantages of this is it could be solar powered. It could be run indefinitely. It has a built-in battery for backup. There's a built-in modem, so you can actually connect to the data and download. You just put a SIM card in, or uh, and you're off to the races. You can wirelessly connect to the meter, um, extract data. You can get uh, texts or emails uh, on any alerts throughout the life of a project, and it's fantastic for a wide variety of acoustic monitoring. Uh, the more permanent solution offers a preamp heater, and you can also couple other things with it, like a wind sensor, humidity, temperature, pressure, um, extra memory if you'd need it, um, things like that and beyond. Um, this is a product from SoftDB um, called the Meso Intensity Probe. Intensity Probe, this, the nice thing about this, if you're not familiar with the intensity method, it's great for sound mapping or developing sound power testing. Uh, the nice thing about this probe is that it actually has all the uh, analysis being done in the probe handle, um, all the signal conditioning for the mics. So really all you have to do with this is plug it in to a USB of a computer and you're ready to go. Um, they make an optional eye track software that combines with the camera to get position tracking for real time. But we find that most people are, seem to be using it just as the probe itself. Um, the sound camera might be tricky for Chad to video as well as uh, take data, but the sound camera is from a company called CAE, um, and it's a 64 channel array. You can kind of can you turn around to see the array, maybe. So the uh, it uses 64 channels, and it's great for um, sound localization. 
So you can use this building acoustics is super popular, any industrial application for a plant, you can actually export the video sound clips or the picture clips. And it's an all in one handheld device that you just hold with two hands It's pretty convenient. Um, uh, for most purposes that array size fits, you know, if you need lower frequency, it might not be the perfect fit, but it's a really good system. Um, I'm going to go to miniature triax excels. Um, PCB has a series of these. They're fantastic. It's the three, five, well, the model numbers are all put up there. The magic of this, if we can get really close to this, it's a one gram mass sensor. It's a quarter inch on a side. Um, get it really close to the camera if you could. This thing is so light. It's down a bit. The, uh, oh, uh -huh. sad Christmas. It's too light to even be seen. No, it is so miniature and it's a triaxial accelerometer. There's four series uh, or four model numbers that go in ranges from 500 G to 20,000 G. It's an adhesive mount, but we also make them in high temp versions. It's fantastic if you're measuring vibration on lightweight panels or something where you're space restricted. Um, it's, it's a fantastic little sensor uh, family. Um, and easy mount clips and actually uh, these Another thing, a lot of tests don't allow you for a permanent installation of a sensor. Um, these clips offer a great little way. It's a little plastic clip, clip that we make in a family of six. And Chad will like snap in the sensor here. All you do is you attach the clips to your test structure via double-sided tape or adhesive. And then you snap the accelerometer to the clips and you're ready to take data. Just remember that you're going to be doing a softer coupling, so it'll be a reduction in the measurable upper frequency response. Um, typically, the measurable frequency response will be around two kilohertz to maybe three, three and a half kilohertz, depending on your coupling. Um, and we also make a swivel clip that we don't show a picture of, um, but that's a perfect uh, thing to do if you're measuring a curved or a sloped surface. And then you can align the sensor along the desired plane and axis. You can match up all your X, Y, Z really easily. And we sell these in bags as well, either the swivel clip or the um, standard clip. Um, and another nice thing, you can actually mount a ton of clip and minimize your cost of sensors and rove the sensors to get a, get a full data set. Um, we don't have a picture of this guy. We just... Uh, the last ones we had in the in the in the door went out the went out the door to a customer this week. Um, these are through hole mount triax excels. These are fantastic device if uh, you've ever installed a stud mount sensor and two of the axes are pointing somewhere weird or there was a cable in the way. Um, a through hole mount sensor is a great option, and this is a triaxial uh, version, so you can really get in there, match up your x and y axes really well. Um, usually don't have too much trouble with the, the normal access to the surface, but uh, great for automotive and a lot of motor and pump testing. Um, this is a product we call Digiducer. This is a modal shop product. It's a true piezo sensor that um, actually, it's kind of in an industrial ruggedized package, but the magic about Digiducer is that uh, you just plug it in, show the other end of the sensor if you could. And on the other side, it's just a USB, meaning you can plug this into your phone or a tablet or a PC, and you're off to the races taking a professional grade piezoelectric instrument. Um, it's fantastic. And I think plug and play is used, overused, but truly, this we use the audio codec for this device. So you can plug it into a, um, something and it'll recognize it. You can plug it into your phone and start taking audio data with the audio recorder app and post-process in MATLAB if you want. Um, it, Digiducer is a fantastic little product. We make it in uh, two form factors. Um, let's talk about Modal Punch for a second. Modal Punch is a weird uh, product that we've had for years. You're testing an automotive axle or something, or you're testing a gearbox shaft, and you just can't get in there. Like, uh, Chad's showing a good example right now. And yeah, yeah. And so this is an instrumented device um, that reaches somewhere inaccessible by a standard impact hammer. 
you can use it with your own non-instrumented hammer. Um, well, Chad's showing an instrumented one there, but you could just use a sledge that you had at home. And he's comparing it to the standard size of a, a regular a hammer. So you just tap the top and you're off to the races. Taking the motor with it, start for a bit. Um, we're gonna go down, if we could. Shipping cases, a lot of times, shipping cases that we sell for products, uh, they're meant to get the equipment to your test lab. But if your testing occurs all over, you may have noticed uh, like in the field or between labs, uh, this, if we ship everything in a sturdy case, it adds a lot of cost when we sell a product. But um, when you need it, it's really handy. Uh, so we make shipping cases for a lot of products here. Oh, I didn't go to the next one, sorry. Um, <laughs> so for shaker systems, tapping machines, um, and the, the big hammer here, this is the handheld sledge that requires two hands to use. Um, the extra shipping case, you can just close it up, uh, lock it if you wish, if, if, if your region allows, and um, you can ship it from there, as you can see some of the shipping labels on that. Uh, it's a really convenient device. And speaking of total hammers, a lot of times engineers seem to get a little hung up on the force spec of a hammer. For example, PCB as a team makes three impact hammers with a 5,000 pound force peak range. And sometimes users mistakenly use that spec as their sole deciding factor. Since impact hammers operate on an impulse that's equal to the change in linear momentum, the mass and the velocity are really the two most important parameters. And velocity we know can be tough to control. So the mass is the key thing. Each of the three 5,000 pound force range hammers have substantially different effective mass specs. The largest is that sledge that we just saw in that uh, case that had about a three foot handle that's held with two hands. It's great for foundations or floors or ships, but let's say you needed to test something that was really um, needed a lot of mass behind it to excite the structure. Um, Model Shop made this uh, Frankenhammer. We really don't have a good model number for it, but. It's really awkward to hold, but it's really powerful to use. It's that same impact head that's kind of on the uh, uh, large hammer we saw earlier, but it's on a short um, handle. So you can swing it, apply a lot of mass to products from that. Pretty convenient. Um, and then um, I'm gonna get this, I'm gonna minimize the window for a bit. Um, tips for using some shakers. There's a lot of tools available. There's a classic HP um, Agilent paper, um, Fundamentals of Modal Testing that we host on Modal Shop site. There's a great series of Dr. P. Davidable's Modal Space um, and on demand and web training on PCB site again, some hosted by it like Pete and such. Um, install your force sensor or your impedance head at the object under test. A lot of times this is mistaken and people um, because the connectors are often 1032, they'll made it at the base of the shaker instead of the object under test, but the stinger can impart dynamics on the structure under test too. So it's important to put the force sensor or impedance head at the test object. Um, maybe, uh, oh yeah, oh, and Chad Mark notes, uh, impedance heads, modern impedance heads are actually labeled as well. Um, so just read the etching on, Head. Avoid any side load on your stingers. This comes to when you're installing the system. Um, consider a piano wire or a tension stinger to reduce side load. Um, if you have a through hole armature, that's a nice advantage of your shaker uh, that you can do that tension based stinger like a piano wire. Use any force interlocks, try to stay safe and not damage any of your equipment. And use more shakers. I mean, You've seen a Siemens PL, PLM GBT seminar. Um, Dr. Avitable has a great article on his modal space series too. It's called, uh, why can't I run a modal test with one big shaker and just crank up the signal? Uh, the answer is uh, found in that paper. It's, um, you really, you really want to get a lot of energy distributed throughout the structure, which can be tough if you're just imparting it one or two tests. So MIMO testing is fantastic. Um, and use tools that are available for shaker positioning. Um, this is a good example. Uh, this lateral excitation shaker stand is really big and heavy, 
so we didn't pull it out. But what you can see, I don't know if you can see my mouse, I don't remember. Um, it's pretty tough, but there's a full size shaker located on this that you can couple that you know, with um, with any electrodynamic shaker. So this is a really great way to provide horizontal input. Um, and you can actually coarse and fine adjust it. This is a really popular product. I mean, any you know, anyone doing structural testing, modal, um, and it's a great way to excite uncoupled lateral structural modes. If you don't use something like this lateral stand, um, you know, I've walked through a lot of labs and the way that people put their shakers up on systems is ridiculous. So this is a nice way to look a little less when you're doing your test. Maybe. And another um, advice, you know, a free boundary condition is often the goal for structural testing. We've seen papers where testers have experimented with large marshmallows or a bottom of plungers, and they get really good results. Um, papers have been written and are still available on the Sound and Vibration Archive online to use various bungee configurations that will let you consider the effects on the system being tested. Um, but air ride supports offer a great method for some structures. Um, I don't know how um, it's going to float in front of you like magic. Um, the air ride support's pretty small, and it, that thing supports, uh, I don't know, 650 pounds easily, and often for body and weight testing for automotive, um, the typical mounting frequency will be less than three hertz. So it's a fantastic option to kind of simulate your free free uh, system for your complete object under test. Perfect for automotive. Some shaker options to consider, and hopefully the we can get this pretty well on the camera. The 2002 E inertial shaker is fantastic for lightweight stuff, um, hard to reach areas. I don't know if. Uh, you can see how small that shaker is. You can just put that on a panel. It mounts directly to the object under test, and it has a an amplifier to match with it uh, right under it. Um, so pretty small. You just drive it, you know, sinusoidal or noise on any thin panel or lightweight or inaccessible object. Um, the smart shaker, most people know. It's one of our most popular products at Model Shop. We've been making forever. Um, the smart shaker we have in four and seven pound versions. It either goes to um, 11 kilohertz or nine kilohertz, depending on the version. But as Chad pulls it up to the camera, you can see the amplifier is built into the base. And it has some smarts built in. It's really nice. It has different gain stages and just a simple BNC to drive it. Um, and some lights to tell you the status. It, it does a lot of smart things like starts on mute so you don't over travel when you connect just like a guitar amp. If you plug your guitar in, you'll get that clip. You don't want that clip when you're putting your test and measurement signal into the shaker. Um, another new thing is we have a uh, high frequency shaker. You can pull out. The 2025 I've listed on here, it's new. It goes to what frequency, Chad? 20 kilohertz. 20 kilohertz. Yeah, it, yeah, I thought as well. It's, it has different, depending on the force range, we believe it goes up to 20K, but um, it's pretty substantial for a shaker of this size. Um, and then the horizontal table shakers behind Chad, what we do is take our 110 or 75 pound shaker and put it on a uh, slip table, essentially. So it's great to support loads that are, aren't suited and Chad moved this thing around. He's gonna, he's gonna, his arms or something. So we put like a little, let's say you were testing uh, an object, an electronic object that was too heavy to directly support on one of our other shakers. The horizontal table is a fantastic way to provide uh, excitation to that structure. You can actually put this whole horizontal table um, sideways so you could still mount things and test vertically. And then impedance heads, never forget the impedance head. Um, and kind of Chad showed you earlier, but it's at the end of the stinger um, right there. Uh, it's it's measuring the driving point, both the acceleration and the force, the dynamic force at your point. Uh, there is an impedance head. Some of our shakers go, you know, beyond 50 pounds. I'll do 100 force pounds. So some special impedance bed heads will actually go up to the full 100 
pound force measurement range of, of the shaker line. Um, this one's a weird product. If you're watching from outside of the States, we apologize at the moment. This is made by a partner company in Switzerland. It's called Rock. And right now it's only a rental product throughout the world. Um, Syscom is the manufacturer and they do make solutions for permanent installation. But Rock here is a great option for temporary measuring of, uh, you know, anything for construction, really any remote vibration monitoring. You turn it on and even without a solar panel, it'll go for six months. It has, uh, it's basically measuring axial velocity, which is common in the construction world. Um, traffic vibration, structural vibration. It's IP65 rated, pretty easy to mount. You can mount it vertically as well. Um, and the data plans included. So you get all your alerts and alarms and things like that. Um, and we'll actually be doing a future webinar series in this same series devoted just to rock. Um, we don't have a picture of this guy, but he's super popular too. The laser tank, our current generation of laser tank has a lot of advantages over the old. You can operate it the same as any ICP sensor from two to 20 milliamps. It provides one pulse per rev that you just put on some retro flight. Um, and it's just an analog voltage pulse train that references the vibration signals to the shaft speed. It, it, it's usable for that. Um, you can measure up to 100,000 RPM from distances about a half a meter or 20 inches. Um, and it's natively supported by a lot of DAC packages. So you don't need that high oversample data acquisition anymore. Um, reusable strain sensors. This is great. We have a few types. This, uh, it's a high resolution dynamic alternative to a, like a bond foil strain gauge. We use a quartz sensing element in, in a durable titanium housing. The magic of this is that it's reusable. It only takes about 60 seconds to install. You can remove it in about 10 seconds, um, get all the way up to about hundred kilohertz of measurement. And we also make another version, a series that is meant for more permanent installations on industrial. Um, this is an example. It's the RHM 240 series um, available in different sensitivities. The surface prep is pretty easy. It's a big advantage in time and cost if you're doing mixed vibration and strain testing. Um, and a lot of papers are being written about this product, even though it's a fairly mature product. A lot of people don't know we have the strain series of dynamic piezo sensors. A relatively new product from our buddies at Indevco. There's a 7360A series. Um, you can kind of see the size in Chad's hand. What this is a true six DOF sensor. It's three DC Excel and three angular rate sensors. Um, it all combined in the compact, you know, small enclosure. It's great for automotive safety, aerospace testing, something in anything harsh, shock and vibe. Um, or ride and handling. You know, we make a lot of versions at different angular rates and different acceleration ratings. Um, Swift, this will be a fun one to hold. Swift is fantastic. It's a uh, measure field force in moments. Um, it's made by our uh, sister company, MTS, along with PCB. Um, it measures the three axis force in moments and the wheel rotational position. Um, you can go anything that we offer in sizes from small vehicles to heavy duty trucks. It's one piece. And so if you've ever done any road load testing or, you know, on, on the road, uh, wheel force testing, it can be a pain in the neck to kind of install. This exploded view in the top right shows it's so easy to install the, the Swift system. Um, and it has a digital can output as well. Um, it's not much to picture here, but use TEDs. Oh yeah. Oh, that's the Swift uh, control box as well to go to the can output and, and, and mate to any of your data acquisition. Um, if you don't know, TEDs is an onboard digital memory that's in sensors when it's connected to a lot of analyzers, it'll just read the Cal values, the model number, serial number, and a lot more. It's been a released IEEE standard for over a decade, but some people keep learning about it. It reduces a lot of errors. Um, you can cable up a lot of sensors 
and automatically know where you are, assuming you knew which uh, serial number you put where. Uh, if you're ordering sensors from PCB, most models have a TLD prefix. Some of the new models, including the modal uh, series 3, 5, 6, A43, 44, and 45, have TEDs built in without that prefix. Um, in the modal shop, we offer a TED sensor interface. So if you do field calibration of your sensor or get it calibrated in an external house, you can reprogram your sensor's calibration information. Um, let's do some notes about cables, things you might not know about cables. Um, the fluorinated ethyl, uh, ethylene uh, prop, propylene is the kind <laughs> If you have a blue triax cable, chances are it's an FEP cable from PCB. But I'm here to tell you, PCB makes other options. They're all blue, but um, there's a silicone and polyurethane. They offer a lot of advantages for flexibility, abrasion resistance. Um, so you can kind of see, oh yeah, bend radius, I think is spec very similarly, but you can almost feel in your hand the improvement of, of movement. And you know, once the world gets a little less crazy and you're able to see your uh, PCB direct, ask to see their cable test kit because you can kind of, you know, feeling is more believing than seeing in this case. Um, and last year, PCB released a new connector for common triax cables. It's great for where moisture or water or dust may be a concern. It's even submersible in water, and it's IP68 rated to a depth of one meter for four hours. It has, um, you can kind of tell it has a little blue hue on the triax connect on the, yeah, connector around it. Yep. Tough to see on a dark background. So you could put that underwater. It's a fantastic option. It's the 034W and 078W series. And then one thing I'd say, oh yeah, you can compare it with the traditional black. Um, consider a direct cable from your sensor to your analyzer. Uh, here's an example where we have, oh yeah, hold that one up again. Um, it's a nine pole Lemo input. That's a great connector that goes directly matched to like a Siemens SCADA system or a Mueller BBN. One end connects to a triax, the other end connects directly to your analyzer. So you don't need to go through breakout cables or BNC cables. Uh, cables like this can be available for your uh, data acquisition directly. It simplifies setup quite a bit. And also a big advantage of ICP is the ability to run long cable lengths. Um, to that end, and the disadvantage of the four pin cables is their small size. So you could always consider something like a extension cable between the sensor and the breakout cable. Um, this cable that Chad has, I think is a hundred feet long and it has one connection on uh, a side that's a female and the other on the male. So you can actually daisy chain these cables together and still take a quality signal across a long measurement run. Um, oh, perfect. Um, if you're testing cables, one thing uh, I want to show is PCB actually makes a cable test box. I don't think most people know about it. Um, kind of pull that up closer. Yeah. It's battery powered. It has BNC 1032 and 544 coax connectors. And it's fantastic. You just plug one end of the cable into one side, the other into the other. And it shows the shield failure, conductor failure, or short circuit shield to connector, conductor trouble um, just on a, a series of lights up at the top. So um, in three green lights, it says the cable's okay. Uh, we all know how cabling gets uh, treated out in the field. So a cable test box is a welcome addition. To that end, we also have a, and DevCo makes a accelerometer simulator, um, Chad showing in the hand. It's a great tool to verify and troubleshoot a signal. Um, it lets you simulate an accelerometer, either a voltage, like an ICP type, or charge mode, either single ended or differential. You can choose your units. Um, you can even use it for TTL for condition monitoring systems. Um, it's great to test and diagnose faults in data acquisitions, environmental test systems, or is really like a flexible signal generator. And the TTL option is great. It lets people doing any condition monitoring set signal conditioning, like tracking filters frequencies without you know, generating an external real-time tax signal. So it's pretty handy to test those as well. 
and it lets you set up to 40 uh, profiles for easy recall. Um, I'm gonna know we don't have like a handheld calibrator. You can show that green guy. I am I guy. Um, calibration's a funny word. Uh, misused, it can cause some engineers involved in the measurement to get really nervous. Um, and other engineers, it's like a security blanket. Let's consider field calibration. Uh, a lot of sensor types offer various methods to perform a quick check before you use it or after taking a measurement, and it lets you troubleshoot your test. It's pretty pretty convenient. The product that Chad has in his hand outputs one frequency at one amplitude. Um, it's great, and it lets you verify an entire measurement chain, including the transducer. But um, if we look at some real data, uh, sometimes the frequency point where you test, you can see an overlay of a damaged sensor. The sensor was likely dropped. Um, you can see some failures that occur at high frequencies that you might not catch with this handheld. So to that end, we make a portable calibration line that's at Modal Shop that's used on a wide range of products. Um, it's pretty intuitive, it's easy to use. You can view the sensitivities on the screen. Um, we have options that let you test for low frequencies. Pretty much all you do is you hook up a sensor on the left, you connect it into the BNC in, and you vary the frequency and amplitude um, you can use it in the field, or you can use it in the lab. Um, the nice thing about it, some of the versions uh, offer onboard memory. You could make a traceable calcer. The shaker has, you know, variable frequency, but it also has a reference transducer built in. So you could go through an entire frequency sweep of hundreds of sensors, um, take the data off, and create traceable calcerts on your own. You know, it's not quite the uncertainty level that you might see on a lab grade cow system that would sell, but it's nothing and certainly helps. Um, and you can see kind of Chad varying the frequency and amplitude, real simple to use. It's battery powered, goes for, you know, a whole day's worth plus of field testing. Um, to that end, there's a portable calibration driver. Um, and basically with is it's a bring your own actuator and control sensor. That portable calibrator we showed you is fantastic if you stand what we'll call a standard sensor. But bring bring one of the rocks over. Like let's say you had a rock, this uh, vibration monitoring system. It's pretty heavy. There's no way that was going to fit on that shaker from that portable calibrator we have. Or even products can be awkward to hold. So just like the PVCs, this model 9000A, Cal driver, it allows closed loop calibration on a wide range of products from, you know, geophones, vibration switches, seismic probes, or even uh, testing a whole electronic device with embedded vibration measurement, something like the rock, uh, or coupled with the horizontal table that we saw before. So bring your own actuator and control sensor, but both are driven and being, uh, being measured by the system. Another one also, also is this, it can be used for this acoustic calibration. You can drive acoustic couplers for back-to-back -back calibration of microphones. Um, this 9917 product that Chad's showing here is great for array mics, can be for precision mics as well. Uh, it's a modal shop product. You can use the smart sign driver we just saw under it or use your own deck. You can see, put microphone one in, microphone under test, reference microphone, and you're off to the races. Um, one note I wanted to say, get back to tips on a little less product, and we're, we're winding down here. Motor Shop has a dynamic calibration and sensors tips. Uh, consider joining the Cal Nation newsletter. There's two or three monthly topics every month. We don't send spam. Um, there's an article archive online of 140 months we've been doing this, so uh, about 12 years. Um, and there's thousands on the mailing list that go nuts over it. It's, it's fantastically written. It's practical for both users of sensors and metrologists that calibrate sensors. Near the end here, I'd say if you have a lack of capital and you want to try something, consider renting. Um, the renting is a fantastic option, even when your funds are tight. Um, 
if you have items break, you need calibration, say, hey, I'd love 20 more Excels, you can get calibrated items pretty fast. And everything that we've talked about in this presentation today can be rented, plus a lot more. We have thousands of channels of Excels and mics, and we just updated the rental price list last month with 100 new items. We kind of lost track. We'd taken a while to make this last update. So, and one thing I want to leave you on, I'll uh, maximize the video again, is a little portable calibrator that we like. Similar to the Digiducer, this little calibrator, um, you can see, is handheld. Um, let me get away from the model number and stuff. Connect any two channels of ICP direct to your phone, your tablet, your computer. Um, you don't, you aren't limited like that Digiducer, you're fixed on that sensor. You can put any mic, any Excel that's ICP directly into this. And we have a ton of options with partners that we've worked with that make software for this. Um, it's fantastic. And again, on the other side is just a USB. So get your adapter to your lightning connector on your iPhone, for example, or your tablet. Um, it's great for portable testing, school use, any educational product, actually. And man, I am going late in my head. I do this presentation normally. It takes about a half hour, but I apologize. Um, so we're close to the end. I would say I'd love it if you could send us your test and measurement tips. Um, we'll send out an email at the end of this. And um, we won't include it, obviously, in this email, but for future topics, any tips are appreciated. We love it. We realize we're all a big community of modal and structural testers. Any information or anything that we can do to help each other is fantastic. Um, the future webinars in this series for 2020 summer, um, next week we have the data to go, that last analyzer box that Chad showed, that 45B39. We'll take a deep dive into that. Um, modal testing, how to shed, set up shakers and things. Uh, for U.S. customers on August 4th, we'll do the ROC, the vibration remote monitoring, uh, common noise measurement pitfalls, how often should I recal my sensor, you know, a lot of smart people debate this question a lot. And uh, then at the end, on the 25th of August, we're going to do sound and vibration measurements. This Ask Me Anything. And here's also where we need your help. So you have a little bit of homework. Um, send us your test and measurement questions between now and uh, hopefully before then. You know, it's um, fantastic to try to explore. And we're going to try to get anyone's questions you'll have. But... Um, in the sake of running a tighter ship than today, we'd like to see your questions in advance so we can um, hopefully get the right people to answer the right things and provide some, some smart help. Um, that's basically it. Much. Um, my name has been Bruce. Chad's been man in the camera. And uh, we appreciate your time today a ton.